Thank you for joining us on another episode of Mental. This month, I have a very special guest in Carlos Suarez. I say special guest because it's it's a friend. I consider him to be a friend, even though he's been a mentor for me. He's been an educator, specifically through my education in the soccer coaching realm. And someone that I've always looked up to and admired for his knowledge of the game and his willingness to share his knowledge of the game. I think that's one of the things that's always set him apart for me is being an open book. And Carlos, without further ado, how about you kind of introduce yourself for our audience today to give them a sneak peek on who you are and what you've done and where you've been and where you are. Well, hello. Thanks for having me, Nick. It's um, any time that I can help or contribute to to the growth and the development of the game, whether it's coaching education or player development or, you know, just the, the game in general. Um, I'm a proponent of supporting the game and I've been doing it for a long time and I'm I I see myself as being very fortunate. Uh I've been able to make a living from the game uh since I stopped playing. It's been a while since I stopped playing, but uh, I went directly from being a player to a coach and I immediately became a college coach at a young age and that's where I started in you know, one thing led to another. Then I started doing youth club. And and then back in the day of ODP, I started in Southern California coaching ODP boys and girls, which led to regional ODP and national ODP events. And I had the opportunity to continue as a coach, getting into the national team level. I was able to coach U16, U20 girls, U17 boys, U23 men with national teams. With the 16s, I was a head national coach. And with the other teams, I was assistant. And then I continue on as an educator. I became an educator for U.S. soccer, and I started teaching licenses. And I've been doing that for a long time, over 30 years now. And continue that way and continue coaching college. Then I, after coaching college for over 15 years, I went into the pro game in, in the old WSA, WSA Women's Soccer League which was a privilege. It was a great experience. Uh, so I did that for a couple of years and then went back to the youth game. I was a director for a club and coach club. And uh, at the same time, I'm continuing to educate people. And And then I went, I had a, an opportunity to coach in MLS uh, also. So I was an assistant in MLS. And I don't know if this is a trend, but WSA is not here. And the team that I was assistant for, Chivas USA is not here anymore. But I was part of that and then had the fortune of working with the men's national team as a uh, chief scout for the 2014 World Cup. So I was a scout for Jurgen Klinsmann. I did that for six years. And then after that, I, I said, okay, let me see where I need to go. And I became a director of coaching for two state associations. Fortunately, those still alive. So I had nothing to do with that. And then I'm back at the coaching at the youth level. I'm in Arizona. I'm coaching with... Utah Royals, Arizona, and ECNL level. And I was just recently coaching with the boys MLS Next. So again, I'm very fortunate. I love coaching. I love teaching. I still teach. I'm currently in, in the process of finishing an A senior pro license. And so in a nutshell, you know, I've been all over the game. I love the game. And I also help with Puerto Rico's men's uh, women's national team, which is another opportunity to, to stay at the highest level of soccer. I was part of the Gold Cup back in uh, February and we did very well. So fortunate, you know, and I'm just looking to continue doing it as long as people want me and let me. And I still have the energy and the passion to do it. So it's a lot of fun. And, you know, like I said, whatever I can do to promote the game and help players and coaches, I'm happy to do it. That's awesome. No, and, and thank you again for taking the time to do it. With you having the vast amount of experiences that you've had, can you speak to the word of the day being perfection? I think so many youth athletes feel in some shape, way, or form, this defines them. They live within these parameters. Maybe we've got that, not just 4.0 GPA student, that person that shoots for the 4.5 that I didn't even know was realistic when I was in high school. Nonetheless, we have these types of student athletes. Can you speak to some of these individuals based on your experiences and how that can help them or flip it a 180, how that can hinder them based on what you know? Of course, I think that you have the, you know, hyper-driven 
athletes, student athletes that, you know, are trying to overachieve. And I think today's society for the young athlete is to be at the top of everything they do. And I think that it's it's a difficult situation. It's a challenging situation for everybody to be perfect. I think that perfection is something that we all pursue. But I also think that we need to sit back and realize that, okay, even though that's our ultimate goal, as long as we reach our, we do the best that we can and we try to reach our potential, you know, maybe that's perfection. Who's to judge perfection? I think it's more about the path and the journey of trying to become perfect. And I think as long as we achieve a high level of competence in everything that we do, and you know, we, we get rewarded emotionally and physically and socially, I think then that's, that's the approach to take. And I think we also need to sit back and, and realize that it's, it's about the process and, and reaching a level of, of happiness with what we do. And, you know, I have four children and you talk about 4.5, one of my daughters, that's, that was her GPA in high school and she continues to do it in college. And I'm like, I'm amazed because of the pressures of academics and sports and family and social. So I think that it's great to have those goals and aspirations, but I think we all need to have a balance in life of family and social and recreation and entertainment. And I think it's, and and that's difficult because there's, there's not enough time to do everything, but I think that that needs to be important. That needs to be part of it because if you're just focused on one thing and that you don't reach those goals, then the risk is, do you see yourself as a failure or do you think you, you didn't achieve it? So it's, it's a difficult situation, but I think it's as long as we are realistic and understand what our expectations are and do the best we can, I think we can be happy. Fair enough. Can you, can you maybe share an experience how that, mindset and some of those things that you just talked to maybe translate into the professional game are they the exact same would you handle your daughter or 14 year old kid really the same or very similar conversation as you would that professional female athlete on the puerto rican national team navigating through maybe some of those mental struggles when it comes to that perfection aspect i'll try i think that i think that obviously again we need to look at ourselves and we need to reflect and we need to say, all right, I think I can be a national team player. I think I can be a professional player. I think I can be a, a, you know, a a college player. I think that I can be the highest and have that as your objective, have that as your outcome and do the best that we can. And I think I have a player on my team who is unbelievable work ethic. She works hard. She's gifted. She's talented. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to have a, one-on-one meeting with her tonight to talk about her progress and where she's at. And and I want her to understand that she's got the ability and the potential to get there, but there's different components of reaching those goals. You know, for a soccer player, obviously, you know, there's there's so much. There's the, there's the technical part, there's the tactical part, there's the physical part, and, and there's the, phys- you know, the psychosocial part. And I think... You need to look holistically at the whole picture because you could be the best technical player in the world, but you could be not so good, you know, on the technical, on the tactical part. And my conversation with her and actually with all my players, most of the time, it goes back to the mental part and the psychosocial part. And I think there needs to be a balance there that it's, yes, you're trying to reach your goals, but first of all, Do you have the drive? Do you have the work ethic? Do you have the mentality to do it? And are you able to maintain that drive if you're uh, successful or not? Because players are going to have lots of bumps on the road and you're going to take 10 steps forward and take five, five steps back. And I think that's okay as long as everything's put in perspective. So I think my talks with my players, I say, look, Here's where I see your potential is, and here are some tools, but it's not a all or none situation. 
And it may take you six months, it may take you two years, it may take you five years to achieve those. And it's just, you know, doing the best that you can and not get discouraged and and maintain the the faith of doing it and 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 persevere and be diligent. So it's a multifaceted situation, but I think it's, it has to do with being realistic and having a, a, a pathway and check the boxes as you go. Um, and it's, it's, it's a continuous thing. So it's the mental part of the game. It has to do with, again, the drive, the work ethic, but also having the, 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 confidence and the faith that if you don't reach your goals immediately, you know, it can take a little longer and that's okay. Right. Right. That, I guess what comes to mind for me to piggyback on, on some of those thoughts is focus more on your progress, not being perfect. And, and I think too many people get bogged down with, well, I, I got most of my shots in training and they beat themselves up over the two they missed or the three they missed. And they forget about the six they made so quickly and I think, again, it's just a dangerous place to live because it's such a subtle shift, but it's such an important shift, as you're alluding to, to say, be okay with those things. And I think the other thing that comes to mind is think of failures as learning opportunities versus just failures in and of themselves and, and have that define you versus saying, what might I need to tweak the next time to improve that a little bit more? And now you're focusing more on the progress and the progression piece versus the ending product saying, I didn't get it. And like you said, it's just such an important mental shift and, and perspective to have as you're navigating your individual journey, whether that you're that 14 boy or girl pursuing that professional dream, or you're that 18 year old pursuing that collegiate scholarship or professional opportunity. Carlos, let's segue into maybe a story or maybe a couple. Are there a couple situations that have just sat with you and really sunk in for maybe from a mental standpoint in general? And can you speak to maybe our audience about an experience or two you've had at the professional level to say, and th this is something that came from this type of player in a world cup or this type of player at the professional playing MLS or, or WUSA when you were there. I can think of a, a player who I coached from 12 years old through 18 as a youth player. And then a couple years in college. And then he eventually went abroad to play in Greece in, in the first division, came back to the U.S., and then he played MLS in the early days, and he actually made the 1998 World Cup team. And he was one of those, from day one, just very gifted, very fast, athletic. And when he was young, I always had the doubt or, okay, he's got all the tools, but at times he doesn't seem like he has the drive because things came fairly natural to him. I don't want to say easy, but just fairly natural. And I remember being hard on him, and and then I realized that he was being extremely hard on himself. Like if he had a bad game, he would, he almost seemed sad and depressed. And... And so I had to kind of learn how to maintain and drive to keep the the the, the confidence and and in the positive with him. That I realized that he was pushing himself so hard that if he didn't achieve the immediate goal, he was feeling like a failure. And I had to basically learn to advise him and say, "Look, this is not about today. It's not about tomorrow. It's." Let's try to fulfill your talent. And, and he became, I remember him being 15, 16. He was a player that was making it. He was ODP regional player. And, and, and all of a sudden, he, he just gained all this confidence. And I could see him blossom because I think he learned that it wasn't about the immediate goals. And he was putting too much pressure on himself. He understood there was a journey. So I, he ended up playing for me college for a couple of years, but we were division three and it wasn't the right place for him. So we had a conversation and he ended up going, transferring to a division one school. And that wasn't the right place for him either because of the environment, 
it, it wasn't it wasn't just the right thing. So he he, he was uh, from Greek uh, heritage. So he went to Greece and he ended up playing in Greece for a few years and uh, developed into a professional player. And then he had the opportunity to come back to MLS and he came back and he played pro. And a funny story about him is that he was a left wing for me. He was right footed, but he had a really good left foot. And we had a good team and he was always like assisting people. And the thing that, that really made him a special person as a player, he was a giver. It was not about him. It was about the team. How can I help? And so he was always assisting other people. But long story short, he, he, when he went to college and then he went to the pros, he became, they made him a left back. And he wasn't very happy because he had always been an attacker. But I remember demanding that he needed to defend. He didn't want to do it. You know, well, I'm a forward, I don't defend. But then he embraced it in a, to your point, you need to embrace challenges that maybe is not what you want. And then he accepted it. So when he went to Greece, they made him a left back. He comes back to the MLS, plays left back. So he made the the roster for the 98 World Cup as a left back. And so sometimes, you know, your path is not what you want, but it still gives you a great result. So... I mean, so from 12 years old, he was, I think he was a 72. So when he was in the World Cup, he was like 26, something like that. And he was at his, at, at his prime. So it took him 14 years to get there. You know, it wasn't like an overnight success. He worked hard, he persevered. So I think that, I think if if we all as players and even as coaches, you know, keep working hard and believe in what we're doing. And and I think humility is also important that we need to understand that we we can always learn and improve, you know. And and today with so many opportunities for men and women, college, USL, you know, MLS, NWSL, there's leagues in Europe. I think there's lots of opportunities. So talent, work ethic, determination, I think give players an opportunity to maybe reach their goals. 100%. Uh, curious, because I feel like, especially in 2024, so many youth, especially the ones listening to this podcast, are usually of the mindset, if you're not D1, you're not going pro, and you're certainly not representing the U.S. But you just told a story and a real example of a kid that went D3 and is on a World Cup roster a handful of years later. Were there conversations out of curiosity at that point in time when you were his coach at the collegiate level to say, coach, I want to represent the U.S.? Or was that not even a part of it? And you know what? His journey just became his journey more organically than it was almost forced. He wanted to be a pro player. And back then, I felt he had the talent, right? The only question I ever had with him was, did he have the confidence to get there? Did he have the the determination to get there? And and that's why I went after two years of playing for me, Division Three, I, I knew that his goal was to play at the pro level. And this is back in the day before um, it, there was no professional game. There was no MLS. So that's why he went abroad. He went somewhere else to become a pro. So... I don't think we ever had the conversation of him ha having playing for the national team, but he was talented enough and he was gifted enough that he was ready when the opportunity came. And I think that's, I think that should be the discussion. You got to be ready for the opportunity, right? Whether you are a small college or division one program, or maybe you're not a college player. And you go and, the, you know, youth, ECNL, MLS Next, you know, USL Academy, whatever the case may be. I think there are lots of opportunities. There's not one specific way to make it to the top. You know, there's sometimes you have to, you know, be ready for the opportunity. So be prepared, work on your game, work on everything. And sometimes the opportunity will, and you're ready for it. If you're not ready for it, you may not get another opportunity. No, that, 
definitely so much truth behind that one. And you spoke to a word that I think segues us into a question from our audience really well. You alluded to confidence. Question from the audience is this, what is or are strategies in your opinion to boost self-belief after consecutive bad performances? Good question. I think it is just my opinion. I'm not an expert on this, but my opinion is it's preparation. So if you if there's a part of your game that you need to improve on, you need lots and lots and lots and lots of practice and lots of repetition. So you may have a poor game. You may you may be a, a forward who misses, you know, opportunities and you feel like you failed. But if you look at the big picture, and sometimes you can look at videos, right? And you look at Ronaldo or Messi or you know, or Mia Ham or those players, they miss opportunities, they miss goals. They did not think of themselves as like I'm horrible now. They had the determination and their confidence came from repetition and training and, and, you know, just thinking, okay, missing is part of the game. More opportunities will come. I have to be ready for the next one. Okay. So I didn't succeed this time. I'm ready for the next one. And if you feel that maybe you missed a one-on-one, -on -one, for example, it doesn't mean that you need to spend now a thousand hours working on one-on-ones. It just means maybe a couple of details to fix the one-on-one. -on -one. So not reinventing the wheel, but maybe there's a detail or two to work on. And it's confidence comes from repetition and confidence comes from doing it over and over and over again. And I accept the fact that, the, that you are going to miss some opportunities, but there'll be other opportunities to make make up for it. And sometimes you may score one that is not expected because you were prepared. So preparation, you know, being a student of the game and 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 seeking the opportunity. So confidence is a big factor. So not do not let some poor performances or some failures hold you back because overall you have a lot of good qualities that will overcome those failures. Yep. Yep. And I just want to really hit home for our audience, again, talking to those teenagers out there, those young adults trying to find that next level and are trying to work through that, that, that dip. It's like, you don't necessarily have control over the dip anymore. You're in it. Now, how can you limit it and be on the upside? And again, want to elaborate on what you touched on, which is focus on your next performance, not your last performance. I think again, too many youth will get themselves bogged down mentally to say, I'm only as good as my last performance. No, focus on your next one because that one you can influence. You can't influence the past performances anymore, but you can perform. You you can have have an effect, and as, as you alluded to, your preparation and what you do next. What is that next play after you miss that shot? Your next play is your attitude. Your next play is your body language. Your next play is to influence the game without maybe scoring a goal. It's through winning the ball back, and now that created a moment in, in and of itself. And now you're you're turning it turning the page quickly versus dwelling in it and living in it and experiencing a feeling that you know you don't enjoy. Such an important, again, it's subtle, but it's such, a, it's such an important one that you can be 14 years old and apply that. It's not just an idea, it's a technique to say, I can switch that and I can switch it when I want to. I don't have to wait two years to, to be 16 before I can, I can make that change, right? You can be 22 years old, never know something as simple as that and say, I can do that on my next game and, and focus on that next play when I do make, make those mistakes that, as you alluded to, they're going to happen. You have to be able to understand how to let those go and not live in those moments. Anything else come to mind? Yeah, I think you also, you need to be careful who you, who you listen to or where the criticism is coming from. I think that whether you're 14 or 20 or 25 as a player, you need to know yourself. You need to know that, okay, I'm able to score. I'm able to cross a ball. I'm able to dribble. That doesn't go away. And if somebody says, well, you should have scored that. And it's, you got to put it in perspective. You say, no kidding. I know that. I know that I should have, and I didn't. But I know the opportunity will come. And I got this. I got this. It, and you look forward to the opportunity. And, and 
it's about being assured of yourself. And of course, there's always a doubt, you know, because you already missed it. But try to shake that doubt again to the preparation and the repetition and the proficiency of it. So be careful. You know, sometimes we listen too much about what other people say and people are t criticizing your game or giving you advice. And with all due respect, they may not know what they're talking about or two, they've never been in your situation. It's so easy to criticize and be judgmental of something or somebody. And we've never been in their shoes. So take it for what it's worth. You know, listen to the people you respect. Look at the video. Look at yourself. Analyze yourself. Get to know yourself. And, you know, just be, be persistent. Love it. Carlos, going to segue into a space. I think I actually stole it from you and Chesler, maybe. Or, or actually, it was, it was a German coaching education. It's called the hot seat. P putting you in a, in a space to say what comes to mind. First thing, try to keep it a, as precise as possible and see where we go with it. You ready? Yeah. What was your go-to pregame pump-up song when you played? Oh, you're not going to believe this, but I did have one. It's... It's a really old one, classic rock, Fly Like an Eagle. There we go. That got yeah. you in the moment. Yeah. Okay. How about what's one of the hardest things you dealt with on the field as a player? One of the hardest things that I had to deal with, ooh, I think I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. I was a very confident player. And I, I, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but back in the day when I played, the, the fields were horrible. <laughs> so I really didn't see too much more difficult than that. As long as the field was okay, then I was okay. Okay. How do you mentally reset after a tough moment today and maybe wish you would have known when you would played? Again, it goes back to, to my belief in myself. And I always, when I reflected, I always focus on the positive and try to ignore the negative because the negative was going to come back. So I only worry about things I could control. I wouldn't worry about things that were out of my control. Perfect. How about thinking of a specific exercise mentally? Do you have a favorite one that you do to help boost your focus? Yeah, and I think this is probably a well-known one, having triggers, you know, from the minute you get to the game, whether, you know, when you're putting your shoes on, or when you're warming up, I always believe in having a routine and I just seem to, that seemed to just get me centered and focused on the game. You know, I was just totally focused on my routine and the warm up, And I always had one or two extra things that I did my, by myself away from the team. And I just kind of like got me ready to go. So a routine or oh, triggers. Yep. Yep. Last but not least, what's a hidden talent or hobby outside of your profession? Oh. Hidden <laughs> Oh, that's, that's a tough one. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think my, 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 my life has been totally soccer focused. And there's one thing I wish I would have been good at, and that would have been singing. And I know I'm not a good singer, but. <laughs> so I don't think I have anything hidden. <laughs> but, you, but you have a wish. I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, let, let's segue into the quote of the day. Quote of the, the day revolves around our word of the day on this one. Perfection isn't just impossible. It's a counterproductive goal. Success depends on high standards, not being flawless. What comes to mind when you hear that? Like I said earlier, I think perfection is, should be a goal, should be an an outcome we're looking for, but it's rarely achieved. And I think it's it's about embracing. You got to have that as your goal. But chances of reaching perfection are so, so, so small that I think if you work hard and you're close to perfection, then you are going, you're getting the best out of yourself. I'll, I'll also tack this on and it's 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 so short lived. Right. If you think about those that reach the pinnacle of whatever profession they do, winning a championship. I heard this the other day from a sports psychologist 
Brett Ledbetter, and he shared with 80% of the coaches that he's interviewed and talked to, 80% of them have gone through depression after winning a national championship. That's Those are adults that are experiencing depression, eight out of 10 people after you talk about being perfect, maybe they didn't have a perfect record, but they're at the top of the top. Like there is no better thing when you're a college coach. That's mind boggling to me, but I guess it goes to show you it, it's so short lived that, that, oh, that relief, because now the next question rolls in. Can you do it again? Can you maintain that standard? And there's only one direction to go from that perfection and that's town. Right. Yeah. And, and you've, you've already elaborated on it, but I'll say it again. It's, Focusing on on that per- progression piece and that perspective piece, because they will keep things in a healthy space and place versus a dangerous place to live to say, I can't get there again. I'm never going to do that again. And, and you're, now you're focusing on how might I be able to retool and recalibrate to make things not 10 percent better, just 1 percent better. And now you're focusing on something tangible that say that you think to yourself, I can I can do that. Right. I can do that much. I agree. You know, that's the, the old saying, you know, is, is, it's so difficult to repeat. And I think what's difficult, again, it's my opinion, it's the journey is so arduous and so hard that when you reach the, your, your goal, whether it's perfection or close to perfection, mentally you're like, it's almost like you have PTSD. Like, am I, am I able to go through that again to reach that objective? It, it sometimes it's painful. And I think that's where maybe that's why it's so difficult because it's, you achieved it and you went through so many ups and downs and, and that, yes. And I, I can relate to when you win a championship or when the season ends or when you, something great happens, like you said, it's, you know, it, it, you can, you can only go downward but I think the different the, the what separates us to continue being successful is okay, yes, it's a natural phenomenon for you to go down, but because of your of of your your background and your consistency, you're able to bring it back up and and be ready for the challenge again. So I think it's a matter of maybe not trying to repeat but trying to repeat the challenge again and 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 continue preparation and learning and improving and it's 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 extremely difficult no absolutely. doubt absolutely absolutely well want to thank our audience for tuning into this one i think a ton of good piece of information regardless of what age you're th- this is getting to you from and wherever and however you're taking it in so definitely worth listening to again want to thank carlos for your time and sharing your knowledge and insight in, into this topic of being being perfectionist because i think we all have it in some shape way or form whether we're a student whether we're an athlete whether we're a professional and it'll continue to be a part of our lives so thank you for the time everybody out there until next time this is this time checking out for now